Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you, high King of heaven, for condescending, taking on flesh, dwelling among us to bring us to yourself. Thank you for giving us your word, that we might know your ways, that we might know your heart, that you might direct our course, our lives, our ministries. God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would use his word this morning to accomplish his work in our hearts and lives. And we ask it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever been commanded, follow the directions? You probably have. Maybe you've taken that exercise in school that says, follow the directions. And the first direction is, read all the directions before you do anything. And then there's a series of 20 complicated directives. Uh, Write your name up here, circle all the commas in this paragraph, and da-da-da-da-da. And you get to the very last statement, and what does it say? Don't do any of the above. And it's a test to see if you followed the directions by reading the directions before you carried on with your business. You turn in your paper, and if it's got a bunch of eraser marks, your teacher knew you didn't follow the directions. I don't know if you've ever had a disaster trying to assemble furniture. Follow the directions. Or if maybe you've experienced a disaster in the kitchen. I was making mashed potatoes one time early in my culinary career. I don't really have a culinary career. But I thought, you know what? Um, I put too much milk in and too much butter, and I'm out of potatoes. And so it's this runny, soupy mess. How do I thicken up potatoes? I don't know, maybe some flour. Some of you are laughing because you know what happened. Some of you were like me. Maybe thought that was a good idea. Uh, It made a pasty, starchy mess about the consistency and flavor of Elmer's glue. (laughs) Following the directions in the kitchen is important. You know, a builder is supposed to follow the engineer's drawn-up plans. You don't freestyle a skyscraper. We are continuing this morning our series on a philosophy of ministry, a philosophy of ministry. And, And we've talked already about preaching the word, shepherding the flock, equipping the saints, growing the church, making disciples. This morning's message is follow the script follow the script. And what we'll be talking about this morning is a philosophy of ministry driven by the Bible. That is, God has actually given us a set of directions to follow in how to do church. And a philosophy of ministry is just a set of governing principles that direct what you do. You can have a philosophy of baseball, a philosophy of education, a philosophy of life. A philosophy of ministry is a set of governing principles that guide and direct what we do as a church. What I want us to think about this morning is what is it that gives us our philosophy of ministry? Uh, It is none other than God's word. We are to follow the script. And, And this answers the question, how do we do church? How do we do church? And this is a question that a lot of people are asking today. And and there are a whole host of varieties of ways to go about doing church. There are probably nearly as many philosophies of ministry as there are individual churches. A lot of strategies out there. There are many styles, many formats, many approaches to church. Should we do high church, candles and vaulted ceilings and languages we don't understand? Or should we do seeker church? How do we get Joe Seeker into the pews? Do we do the franchise model or the corporate model? Do we do house church or mega church? Are we revivalistic? Do we do urban church or suburban church or cowboy church? Do we aim to have the church be as diverse as possible or do we aim to the church to be as monolithic as possible? Do we pick a demographic? Do we make a demographic? Do we attract a demographic? Are we aiming at intellectuals or anti-intellectuals? And the list goes on and on and on of what kind of a church we want to have and how do we go about getting it. Before we dream about the kind of church we want, before we try to imagine what kind of church the people out there would want to come to, we must ask the question, what does 
God want? What does God want? And it's a simple question, and it actually has a simple answer. You see, God has given us a set of instructions about how to do church. And it is incumbent upon us not to reinvent those instructions, recreate those instructions, get creative about those instructions, but to simply follow those instructions. I want to turn your attention this morning to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll be looking at verses 14 and 15. This is God's word from the Apostle Paul. He says, I'm writing these things to you, Timothy, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I'm delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. What I want to do this morning is give you three reasons to follow God's direction for the, for the church. It's a very simple outline, just three simple reasons to follow God's directions for the church. And the first reason is simply this, God cares about how the church operates. God cares about how the church operates. Uh, first and foremost, the set of instructions is actually given to us in God's word. God gave us these instructions. And we see this in verse 14 of 1 Timothy 3. Paul writes, I'm writing these things to you, Timothy, hoping to come to you before long. In case I'm delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. Paul here is writing to Timothy. Timothy is Paul's protege. He's a pastor. He's pastoring in the church at Ephesus. And Paul is writing. He says, I'm writing even though I'm hoping to come to you. Paul hopes to come and see Timothy, but he's going to write anyway. And he says, I'm hoping to come to you soon, and even though I'm hoping, I'm still writing, and I'm writing in case I'm delayed. And the, the phraseology here grammatically indicates that Paul probably will be delayed. He's expecting to be delayed, even though he hopes to come soon, and because he realizes he probably will be delayed, he writes to Timothy. There's an urgency in what Paul is saying here. What he's writing is so important that even though Paul had spent time with Timothy, even though Paul had spent probably three years ministering at Ephesus, even though Paul was hoping to return to Ephesus in the near future, the occasion for writing was urgent in Paul's mind. He could not wait for his return to Ephesus to get this information out. Timothy needed these instructions. The church at Ephesus needed these instructions. And we need these instructions. This is likely not new material for Timothy. Paul has been discipling this young man, has installed him as a pastor at Ephesus. But this is in written form for the benefit of Timothy and for the church. To have these things in writing from the Apostle Paul would benefit Timothy in his pastoral ministry as well as the church as they listened to these things. And God saw fit through the Holy Spirit to have Paul pen these words to Timothy so that, and notice this, so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. Literally, this would read, how it must be conducted in God's household. How it must be conducted. This is an instruction manual for the church. I love it when a biblical author tells us his reason for writing, right? John does that at the end of his gospel. I'm writing these things to you so that you may believe, and by believing you may have eternal life. And here Paul does something similar. He says, I'm writing these things to you, Timothy, so you'll know how to do church. What are the these things in verse 14? I'm writing these things to you. Some have said Paul is directing his attention specifically to chapter 3, directions about installing qualified elders and deacons in the church. Others have said this extends to, back to chapter 2 in the instructions he gives there. Some say it extends forward to chapter 4 and following. Because the reference is general, and because Paul says to Timothy, I'm instructing you, Timothy, how one ought to conduct himself or how conduct is to be had in the church. Uh, I believe these instructions are broader than Timothy, broader than chapters 2, 3, and 4 of this epistle, but extend to the entirety of Paul's letter as his purpose for writing. 
And I believe the principle here extends beyond 1 Timothy to 2 Timothy as well, Paul's second letter to this pastor at Ephesus for instructions about how to operate in the church. And I believe this extends to the book of Titus. We see something similar there. Paul tells Titus why he wrote. He says, I, for this reason, Titus, Titus 1.5, I left you in Crete so that you would set in order what remains. There's Paul's purpose statement for his letter to Titus. And what was it that Titus was to set in order? To install qualified leaders, to quash false teaching, and to encourage godly living. Or as Scott has said, to see that the church on Crete has scrutinized leaders, silenced lies, and sanctified lives. These purpose statements in these three letters, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, have caused the church historically to group them together. As early as the second century, the church used these three letters as an instruction manual for how to do church. And it wasn't until the 1700s that, as far as we can tell, someone finally called them the pastoral epistles or the pastoral letters. Uh, but ever since the 1700s in the English language, uh, they've had that title. And we call them the pastoral epistles. Notice how this purpose statement is summarized in 315, so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself. You see, God cares about how the church operates, how it functions, and what it does. If we could survey just briefly this morning a few of the instructions given in the pastoral epistles, we can quickly answer the question, what are the kinds of things the church must do? In 1 Timothy 1, we see this instruction, protect God's people from false teaching. In 1 Timothy 2, pray for government leaders. In 1 Timothy 2, instruct women. In chapter 3, put in place qualified elders and qualified deacons. In 1 Timothy 4, point out bad teaching. In 1 Timothy 4, read the word publicly, exhort and teach. Chapter 5, confront sin, care for widows, ordain men for service in the church. In 1 Timothy 6, instruct slaves and instruct the rich. In 2 Timothy 1, cling to the truth and faith and love which are in Christ. In 2 Timothy 2, train men for spiritual leadership and the teaching of God's word. Rehearse the gospel, teach holy living, refute and correct false teaching. In 2 Timothy 3, the encouragement there is to sniff out wolves that are in and amongst the sheep. 2 Timothy 3 encourages preparing God's people for persecution. The command in chapter 3 is to continue to teach, reprove, correct, and train with the God-breathed word. And in 2 Timothy 4, the very solemn warning, preach the word in season and out of season. Do the work of evangelism. In Titus 1, appoint qualified leadership. Silence rebellious men and false teachers. In Titus 2, speak sound doctrine. Instruct men and women. Rehearse the gospel and its effects. In Titus 3, teach God's people to submit to the authorities over them. Encourage godly living. Avoid foolish controversies. Reject factious people. And encourage God's people to meet pressing needs. It's a list of clear instructions about the kinds of things the church must be doing. This is how one ought to conduct oneself in the household of God. And we could go to other New Testament commands for churches. The church was promised in Matthew 16. It was given instructions about church discipline in Matthew 18. Of course, the church was birthed in Acts chapter 2. But even before the church was birthed, Jesus gave instructions about what the church is to do. We could go to New Testament passages about baptism in Matthew 28 or the Lord's table in 1 Corinthians 11. In fact, the, the letters in the New Testament are almost entirely written to churches. From Romans to the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. And they give specific instructions about what churches are to be like and what they are supposed to do. We want to know what a church ought to be like. We need to open the pages of the New Testament. When someone suggests an innovation or I have a new way to do church, we ought to pause 
and read the pastoral epistles and maybe just write down all of God's instructions for how to do church. And then take the other New Testament letters written to churches to instruct them and in how they ought to be operating. And then take Jesus' instructions to the church. What should the church be doing and how should she be doing it? First and most, we should not be looking out at the world around us. We should be looking down at our Bibles. You see, a great measure of a church is, is the church faithful to its charge? Is the church living in fidelity to the New Testament? And if you ever have to look for a church, take out that list of biblical mandates for how to do church and ask, how does this prospective church measure up to the New Testament? By the way, if you're taking out that list right now and measuring it up against Grace Bible Church, I'm just going to confess, we're not where we need to be yet. <laughs> we're aiming at things and we're not perfect. I'm not sure any church is going to be perfect this side of eternity. But the question is, what is a church aiming at? What is a set of governing principles that drive what a church does? Now, the bottom line is this, God cares about how the church operates. And he has given us instructions. And for us, the message is simply this, follow the script. Let me give you a second reason from this text to follow the script. The church is God's household. The church is God's household. And two descriptors follow here. The church is the household of God, and it is the church of the living God. First of all, let's think about the church as the household of God. It's clear earlier in this chapter, verse 4, verse 5, verse 12, what Paul means by household. He talks about uh, elders and deacons and their households. He's talking about a fatherly role over a home. And the church is God's household. He is the father. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. The church belongs to him. It is his family. That means... It is characterized by God's love and affection and authority and direction. God is in charge, and God is jealous for his household. No man has the right to step into God's household and rearrange the furniture, change the rules, adjust the paint scheme. This is God's household. And this is also called the church of the living God. The living God. And that phrase, the living, the living God, evokes reverence, sometimes terror, uh, sometimes affection, depending on the way that it's used. This is the, the, the taunt uh, that David used against Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, 26. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? That is, the Old Testament used this phrase to set the one true God apart from dead idols. Listen, you, you can taunt idols. They can't do anything. But you don't taunt the living God. He is the one true God over and against idols. But also this was used as a, as a term of affection. David cried out, when can I be in the house of the living God? You see, the living God is a, a terror to those who aren't rightly related to him, but a joy and a delight and a home for those who are his. We have been cleansed, Hebrews 9.14 says, to serve the living God. But Hebrews 10.31 also says it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, the church belongs to God, the one true God, the living God. He's the owner of the church, the head of the church, the authority of the church. He's the one who assesses the church and gives direction to the church. We know that God purchased the church with his own blood, Acts 20, 28. And this fact ought to make us very wary about straying from his directions for how the church is to operate. You see, the church is not a human institution to be run any way that we want according to the fads and trends of our day, according to the whims of a lost culture around us. We do not have the freedom to be innovative, to reject God's mandates and to replace them with our own ideas. Let's just think through a few examples of how this is done in our day. We know that Matthew 18 is hard. 
It's a difficult process. Your bulletin today has a description of the fact that Grace Bible Church practices Matthew 18. We follow Jesus' instructions about how to love each other well in the context of unrepentant sin. It's not an easy process. It's not easy to do well. It's not easy to do with love. And yet is the way Jesus has instructed the church. But do you ever think, man, who would ever come to church with a bullet announcement like that? And you could see the temptation to uh, take that announcement out. And, and maybe not follow Jesus' instructions to the T because people wouldn't understand that. It, it seems harsh. It sounds like Roman Catholic excommunication. Uh, and so let's just cut that out. Maybe in an entertainment-driven culture, we recognize that people have short attention spans. So don't preach long sermons. I mean, come on, Smith, can't you just put some movie clips up there? And uh, I, I'm drifting uh, in fact, I'm not even listening to what you're saying right now because I started thinking about what I'm going to have for lunch and World Cup and stuff like that. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? You were thinking about that. Besides, we shouldn't be having one-sided monologues. The preaching is outdated. We, we really ought to be having a conversation here. Or maybe what we need to improve the church are people with marketing savvy real-world business experience, you know, type A personalities who can get things done or celebrity appearances. Maybe we need the intellectual elites, the impressive people. We can have Hollywood stars and, and actors and, and, and athletes come in and, and, and draw a crowd. Then we could get our message across. And, and, and friends, you know these things are done in our own neighborhood, the, the strategies of giving away Disneyland tickets to the first any number of visitors that walk through the doors. I mean, how else is anyone ever going to step in here and listen to our message? By the way, if, if you took the Disneyland if you took the Disneyland tickets and visited just to get the tickets, I'm not holding that against you. <laughs> but if the church's success depended on our creativity and ingenuity, and marketing savvy, and attractive personalities, then Jesus would never have said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. He might have said something like, I'll get this church thing started, but it's really up to you guys to figure out a way to keep it relevant. The purveyors of new strategies for how to do church in effect, are saying Jesus didn't know what he was doing. God doesn't know what he's doing in the instructions that he gave. I, uh, I came across a, a website called Reinvent Church. Reinvent Church. I didn't just come across it, I was looking for it. <laughs> and they said, we are planting a church in 2018, not yet named, and we're going to reinvent church. What do we dream about? What kind of church do we dream of building? By the way, that is just a terrible statement in and of itself. What kind of church do we dream of building? The answer to this question begins by recognizing the Father's heart for our city. That is, what is it that God desires to do in our city? If it is the deepest longing of the Father to reach lost and hurting people in our city, then what do we need to be and what do we need to do to accomplish that? Is it possible to create weekend worship experiences that unchurched people would actually enjoy attending? And it goes on and on and on. Frankly, this isn't a question we should be asking. What should we be doing to build the kind of church that we're dreaming about? What is the question we should be asking? What does God say? Let me give you a third reason to follow the script. God has entrusted his church with his truth. He has entrusted his church with his truth. Look how verse 15 ends. This household of God, which is the church of the living God, is the pillar and support of the truth. The pillar and support of the truth. 
And a pillar is a column that supports something. It, it, it upholds a structure. And support is the word in the New American Standard. This is a word that only shows up once in your New Testament. It's an architectural word. Um, it's translated in, in other English versions as a foundation or a buttress or the ground or bulwark of something. And all of those get at the idea of something architectural that provides a firm basis for something. In what sense is the church the support of the truth? I, I thought the, the church was supported by the truth. And yes, that's true too. But God wants to detail something very critical in this text that gets to the very reason the church exists. This architectural imagery is fitting for the very serious relationship that the church is to have with the truth. The church is the structure which upholds and presents the truth before the world. The church has something of a stewardship with the, church, with the truth. The church is a custodian of the truth. And every local church has this responsibility. God's household, his family of believers is entrusted to uphold the truth of the word before the world. Now, the Roman Catholic Church has taken this uh, relationship of the church and the truth and made it backwards. Uh, they've taken this idea of pillar and support to mean source. They've taken it to mean that the church is the source of the truth. I don't know if you've ever tried to share the gospel with a committed, knowledgeable Roman Catholic. Uh, quoting Bible verses, uh, I've had the retort back to me, well, hey, don't quote your Bible at me. We gave you that book. And the thought in Roman Catholic theology is uh, the Roman Catholic theology is the source of truth and the Roman Catholic Church gave the scriptures to the world. And the irony in that is in history, the Roman Catholic Church did not actually put the scriptures before the world, but avoided the scriptures and then hid the scriptures, buried the scriptures, persecuted the scriptures, silenced the scriptures, and burned the scriptures at the stake. So when we talk about the church being the pillar in support of the truth, we're not talking about the church producing the Bible. No, the, the Bible produces the church. But what we do mean is the church is something of a scaffolding on which the truth is manifest. It is seen. It is from the church that the truth is proclaimed and heard. And it is in the church where the truth is manifest. And not just manifest in head knowledge, but in life transformation. This is where the world gets to see what the truth does. What truth does Paul have in mind in here? He calls it the truth with a definite article. It is specific truth. It's God's truth. And I think this phrase indicates the truth of the gospel, the truth of the word of God, this body of doctrine given to us by God and his word. And it is the church's responsibility as a steward, as a custodian of the truth, to be involved in preservation, the preservation of the truth. And think about before 1450 with the very critical invention of the printing press, the preservation of Scripture happened by hand, hand copies, <laughs> tedious work uh, where people who loved the truth and lots of people who didn't love the truth but just had a job by candlelight copiously made copies of the scriptures to preserve it, to preserve it accurately and correctly, to pass it on. That has been the church's task through church history, preserving the truth. Also, proclamation of the truth, making the truth known, publication of the truth, Sending out copies of God's word uh, to the ends of the earth. Translation of God's word. Where God's truth needed to transcend language boundaries. Martin Luther into German. William Tyndale into English. The Mitchells and the Cans into the Doe language in Papua New Guinea. This is the church's task to sing the truth, to preach the truth, to live out the truth, to speak truth to one another. The church is a structure supporting the truth in its presentation to the world, but also it is a household in which the truth is lived out and experienced. God's family is actually to conform its conduct to this truth. Why are these the church's responsibilities? 
because the church is to be populated by believers. Regenerate people, people who have been born again by the Holy Spirit who penned the truth. Without regeneration by the Holy Spirit, people don't understand the truth. People who have been purchased by the blood of Christ, who have submitted to the lordship of Jesus, who are loved by God and who are regulated by his word. And listen, if the church is silent, then where will the world hear this truth? If the church fails to manifest the truth in its conduct, how will the world see it? This relationship to the truth is not the task of the academic institutions, nor is it the task of governments or politicians. This is the task of Jesus' church to be the pillar in support of the truth. The importance of the ministry of the Word of God in the local church cannot be overstated. In the proclamation from the pulpit, in the life of the people. Listen, when you see a people impoverished for the word of God, you see a dying church. When you see a pulpit empty of the word of God preached, you see a dead or dying church. We must follow the script. Read the pastoral epistles and just notice how many times you see commands, instructions relating to doctrine and teaching and preaching and proclamation and the centrality of the word in all of it. I want us to think about some implications for us. Implications for Grace Bible Church. The first one that comes to my mind is that we can shore up what remains. We need to shore up what remains. What does the New Testament indicate that the church must do that we're not yet doing? Or that we're not yet doing well? Is there anything that we've been doing that we should stop? Is it possible that we could unwittingly inherit ideas and practices from cultural Christianity, from tradition, or from the world around us that are not in harmony with the New Testament model of the church? That's important for us. And and that process of bringing the church into conformity with the New Testament is a never-ending one. One of the hallmark phrases of the Reformation was semper reformanda, right? Which is always reforming. The Reformation wasn't done in the 1600s. A spark was lit and the scriptures were discovered and the church has the task of perpetually conforming itself to the pattern in the New Testament. We won't be done with that task. We must aim at it and always be about that business. A second implication for us is we need to evaluate our traditions. Say, wait a second. Grace Bible Church, we've only been in this building two years. We don't have any traditions. We've only been around 17 years. We're not old fogey church. The older churches get the more accretions you have of traditional things. And and we begin to talk about what we're doing because it's the way we've always done it. And we have those things. We have to be careful about those things that the New Testament wins, not our traditions, not our cultural accretions. And so we're perpetually reading the pastoral epistles and and the book of Ephesians and and Jesus' instructions. We're asking, why do we do what we do? And and we need to be able to answer with chapter and verse. Or maybe we've just grown accustomed to doing things a certain way. We have to be careful about that. I remember the first time I was struck by these two verses. It was in 2001, and I committed that day to read something out of the pastoral epistles every single day. And and I haven't been perfect, but I've been in the 90 percentile of reading from the pastoral epistles for the last 17 years. And I think we as a church need to continually do this, evaluate our traditions in light of the New Testament. And then a third implication for us, and, and we'll take a little more time on this one. We have to resist the temptation toward pragmatism. We have to resist the temptation toward pragmatism. What what is pragmatism? Pragmatism is the what works disease. What works? I've got a problem. I need a solution. Uh, Open the bag of tricks, anybody's bag of tricks, and let's solve the problem. And in the business world, in a a marketing world, in, in a lot of different venues... 
pragmatism works and, and is helpful. But when it comes to the church, pragmatism is actually deadly. It's deadly to the church. The churches fail in their divinely commissioned task in our day by succumbing to pragmatism. Churches compromise their message or they compromise their methodology, which actually compromises the message, when they succumb to pragmatism. When they try to figure out what works rather than asking the question, what does God instruct us to do? Listen, some of God's instructions are counterintuitive to the trends of pragmatism. And it's supposed to be that way. This is a serious temptation for churches and ministries today. Ministry is hard. And successes are hard won. We read about the missionary enterprise. We, maybe you read missionary biographies and, and, and you skip to the end of the story and, and, and you skip all the, all the persecutions and the perseverance and the trials and the hardships and you just think, wow, what a great thing God did. All those people came to faith. Maybe you read about great awakenings. First one was good, bad one. Second one was not so good. Maybe you read about, about revivals. We need to have a revival. How can we produce a revival today? I, I have been and operated in church contexts where we scheduled revivals. Maybe you've read the book of Acts and you notice the rapid expansion of the church and the gospel from Jerusalem to Samaria, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the Roman Empire. You think, that has to happen today. And, and normal operating procedures are not producing that rapid expansion and growth like I read about John G. Patton and, and William Carey in the book of Acts. So, and they were a long time ago. Maybe we need new methods, new ways of going about things. We begin to ask, how can we make the church successful? And my friends, failing to follow the directions is serious compromise. The temptation toward ministry innovation can be traced to flawed theology. What's underneath this idea that, that we got to capture some means or some method to, to make the church flourish? And there's always flawed theology underneath that thinking I want to expose that theology for you. It comes in several categories. Wrong ideas about man, wrong ideas about God, and wrong goals. Let's start with the goals. We think of church success, ministry success sometimes in terms of numbers. You know, pastors get together, they say, hey, pastor, how big's your church? How many people been there? Oh, you're losing people? Oh, you're gaining people? Wow, things are going great. The size of a ministry is no measure of its fidelity to the New Testament or its faithfulness to God or its true success. We must never be captivated by the wrong goals. What are the goals? What, what was Paul's goal in Colossians? To present every man complete in Christ. That's a good goal. What was Jesus' goal in Matthew 28? To make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Right? If the goal is, how can I get as many decisions for Christ, or how can I get as many people to just sit in a service? If those are our goals, they are the wrong goals. And lots of people does not mean success. The wrong kind of goals will push us towards pleasing men. To conform the church either to our own preferences or to conform the church to what we believe are the preferences of the people we think would want to attend. The alternative to that is to be pleasing to the Lord, to trust the Lord. And just like in any manner of obedience, following the instructions on the church is a matter of faith. It's a matter of faith. Faith and obedience are not at odds with each other. They're not enemies. They're friends. They hold hands. True obedience is fueled by a trust that, God, your ways are better than my ways, and I trust you. Pragmatism and faithfulness are at odds with each other. 
Pragmatism is produced by flawed theology. It's produced by a high view of man. A high view of man that that results from an inadequate view of depravity. If we don't believe that man is what the Bible says he is, we're going to get into all kinds of trouble. Inadequate views of the depravity of man leads to a brazen self-confidence in our abilities to meet man's needs. Listen, if man isn't that bad, then I have what it takes to meet his needs. I can produce the kinds of ministries and programs and effective communication that, that meet him where he's at and, and give him a better, happier life and a little bit of Jesus and, and whatever else I think is important. If I believe that man is a pretty good creature that just needs a little bit of Jesus added to his life or, or some self-improvement or some education or moral reform or, or some motivation, maybe he just needs to make some new decisions and commitments in order to succeed in life or to have a better self-esteem, then whatever strategies I can come up with may suit that need. The problem is those are not biblical categories because those are not man's fundamental problems, and so my innovations cannot be the solutions. If man is what the Bible says he is, born spiritually dead, unable to fix his spiritual condition, in need of new birth, if he is an enemy of God, walking in rebellion against his maker, and he has no hope and no help within himself to fix his predicament, then what man needs is not of this world. What man needs is supernatural intervention, One of my mentors has called the the piling up of man's problems his homardiological complications. It just means uh, sin is a big deal. And it comes in various layers. First of all, man's own sin, the first homardiological complication, is his depravity. Just like a, a dead man can't walk out of his own tomb... A spiritually dead man cannot spiritually heal himself, cannot fix his problems. He needs help outside of himself. And what are spiritually dead people able to do? Nothing. Nothing. God must make them alive. So to appeal to a spiritually dead person and to ask that spiritually dead person, what do I need to do to get you into Jesus today? is flawed fundamentally. He doesn't know what he needs. He doesn't know what his problems are. And he can't possibly come up with a solution. Man is committed to his own idolatry of self. He wants to be in charge. He wants to worship and placate anything he can in order to provide what he thinks he needs. And what he needs is new birth. It's radical. There's another homardiological complication, and it is satanic blinding. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they will not see the glory of God in the face of Christ. They don't understand the gospel. Until the Holy Spirit turns the lights on, until God makes them alive, they are enslaved to and blinded by Satan. There's a third complication, and it is the world system. That is the entire culture of humanity committed against God. All of man's religions, all of man's anti-religions, all of man's self-efforts, all of his self-help, every institution of man is part of this world system. And it will always tell man that his problems are not what the Bible says, but they're something that you can either pull yourself up by your own bootstraps or trust me, I got the answer over here. And that world system is antagonistic to what man really needs. And there's a fourth complication, and it is judicial hardening. Judicial hardening. This is the giving over to sin by God of the sinner. Right? This is detailed in Romans 1. Judicial hardening happens in a lot of other places in Scripture. It basically goes like this. You want blindness? I'll turn out the lights. You want deafness, I'll remove your ears. You want a stiff neck and a hard heart, I will give you over to it. You want sin, I'll give you over to further sin. 
Listen, the worst thing you could get is what you're asking for. If what you're asking for is less of God and more of sin. And all of these complications, human depravity, satanic blinding, the world system, and God's judicial hardening are complications that cannot be overcome by gimmicks, by giveaways, by marketing gurus, by celebrity appearances, by high production value, excellent programming, and top-notch music. Those things don't have the power of the solution that man desperately needs. The only solution to man's problems is God, the gospel, the word of God, faithfully followed, believed, prayed, sung, lived, proclaimed. Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. What is it that's going to bring people to faith in Jesus Christ? It's the truth of God's word. What is it that's going to cause people to grow in Christ? It is the truth of God's word. Now, what God has given us in the pastoral epistles and in the New Testament letters are principles. There are some specific directives, and these directives do not uh, specifically address every single conceivable hypothetical circumstance. They don't tell you what time to turn the lights on on a Sunday morning. They don't tell you to have soft chairs or wooden pews. Okay, you need to understand churches aren't clones And there are a lot of different ways, a lot of variety of ways to flesh out these biblical principles. The point is not that every church is going to look the same. But you should be able to see identifiable features in a biblical church when it is following the principles laid out in Scripture for how the church must operate. Faithful ministry principles should work in any era, any culture, any demographic. What we do at Grace Bible Church by philosophy of ministry, by the governing principles, by the DNA that drives what we do and how we do it, ought to work in the mountains of Papua New Guinea. They ought to work in a persecuted church. They ought to work amongst the rich and amongst the poor, amongst any ethnicity, any culture, any class, any region. A great tragedy occurs when churches try to couch the message in methods and terms to which the world is agreeable. We think, oh, if the world's going to come hear the gospel, we need to make them feel comfortable. And just the opposite is true. You have nothing to offer the world if you make the church like the world. You have everything to offer the world when you exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and you preach the gospel and you proclaim his word. Listen, all of you are here. How did you get here? You got here by the power of God and by the truth of his word. And we continue to do these very things in faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ and he will build his church. A high view of God, a right view of man, a high view of the scriptures, a clear gospel they will drive us to value faithfulness over cleverness. And humble, dependent faith will compel us to follow the directions, to follow the script. Where's the power? Pragmatism tells us that the power is in us. God's strategies are inefficient, insufficient, and ineffective. God's word is outdated and can be ignored. Man has constitutional spiritual problems requiring supernatural solutions. And no ingenuity of man, no music style or architecture or some way to create an atmosphere, no human persuasion or cleverness will ever accomplish what God himself can do. What the truth of the word of God actually does. If the church is to be faithful to her charge... And if she is to be truly successful, she must follow the script. Lord Jesus, we thank you. You love the church. You purchase the church with your own blood. You establish the church. You gift the church. You are head of the church. You have ordained leaders in the church to equip all of the believers for the work of ministry in the church. 
And our desire, O oh Lord, is to be faithful. May it be, true, may it be true that Grace Bible Church will be doing the same things decades from now that it is doing this week. May we not depart from your word, but grow ever closer in conformity to it. Help us to see where we need to grow and keep us from the temptation of succumbing to the pressures inside and out of compromising your methods and your message. We know, O oh Lord, where the power is. It is in your cross, your death in the place of sinners, your resurrection. That is where the power is for radical change for anyone who would come to you. Make us faithful proclaimers all of our days of the power of the cross. Amen.